Support for Carolina Business Review provided by Grant Thornton. Operating in more than 100 countries, our tax audit and advisory professionals specialize in helping companies unlock their growth potential. Blue Cross and Blue Shield of South Carolina, where healthcare is changing for the better. Find out how at ahealthysc.tv. And by Sonoco, a global manufacturer of consumer and industrial packaging products and provider of packaging services with more than 300 operations in 35 countries. Another reminder this past week when the rate of those without a job in the Carolinas ticked up again. That squarely illustrates that the challenges to our region's competitiveness and business development is still very much an issue. Welcome again to the most widely watched source of Carolina's business and public policy. I'm Chris William and happy fall almost. In North Carolina, 8.9% of the workforce was unemployed, which keeps the old North state in the top five states in this country with the highest rate of unemployment. And in South Carolina, it's not as bad, but still an uptick to 8.1%. Why? Where are the pressure points that we need to apply better policy or maybe better strategy? And how do we decide what strategies need our limited attention and resources to that end? We ask our expert panels which direction we need to go in in those questions. And later, before he retires, the president of Clemson, James Barker's back. Major funding also by Novant Health, bringing you world-class technology, clinicians, and care when and where you need it. The Duke Endowment, a private foundation enriching communities in the Carolinas through higher education, health care, rural churches, and children's services. And by Blue Cross and Blue Shield of North Carolina, who's responsible for rising health care costs? Join us and many others in a candid discussion at letstalkcost.com. This edition of Carolina Business Review was recorded August 23rd, 2013. On this week's program, Trip Dubar of South Carolina Future Minds, Ivan Erlob of North Carolina Sustainable Energy Association, and special guest, James F. Barker, president of Clemson University. And now, here's Chris William. Hello, welcome to our program. Um, I guess happy back to school, guys. It's kind of <laughs> strange. Wow. Well, welcome to the program. Good to have you both here. Tripp, you know, I, I know you're not a jobs expert, but, you know, I, I, it seems like the elephant in the room when we talk about, about policy and about what we're trying to do to further development here in the Carolinas is this jobs number. This is, this is huge. North Carolina is almost back up to 9% unemployment. South Carolina is above 8%. Uh, what can we do about these jobs numbers? Well, to, to my mind, you know, and I look at things through, you know, uh, one set of glasses, but to my mind, it, it always comes back to education. Uh, we need better trained workers. We need the, the, the workforce that the industry needs. There's been a study recently that showed that over half of the jobs in South Carolina will require at least a two-year degree by, um, I think it's 2018, mm -hmm. which isn't that far away. And fortunately, in South Carolina, there, there are groups that are trying to do this. Uh, we've been, South Carolina Future Minds has been a part of a much larger group now called Transform SC that includes New Carolina, AT&T, BB&T, school administrators, school board association that are trying to really change the dynamic of how our schools um, go about their business uh, instead of, uh, well, I, and I think we've gone beyond the, the, um, the argument of what do we teach and really more how, how do we teach in a way that's appropriate for how kids learn. And I think what you'll see, at least you know, in in, in South Carolina and how we're we're dealing with it, is it's it's breaking down to almost three parts. There's this this research laboratory of this group that New Carolina and the Transform SC crowd are doing. Right. Where it's, you're going to see payoffs five to ten years down the road. Well, can, can we go that long? Can it can it happen quicker than five or ten years? Yes. And those are the other two parts. There's a there's a, a group of I'd say the Riley Institute up at Furman is a, is a representative of this. They're doing things like new tech schools. Uh, down in Clarendon County where they're taking proven concepts elsewhere in the country, bringing them here like project-based learning and a little more computer-based learning, and they're, and they're trying those. And then South Carolina Future Minds, we're trying to give handles where people can help straight away by, you know, connecting with private gifts to either individual schools mm -hmm. or districts. So you've got the long-term 
uh, Transform SC is shorter term with the Riley Institute and, and proven projects, and then South Carolina Future Minds with Direct Connect, so that you know, at least you can have uh, those that may have good ideas have an easy way to and, help. And, and, and in the interest of, of disclosure here, Clarendon County, Colleton County, some of these counties at risk is where you're going to first. In other words, firemen run into the fire, so to speak. Well, you know, you, you, it, it's all over the state. You know, right, th those, right, are, those right. are the ones where the new tech schools are going in. That's where a lot of the interest is. But some of the most innovative things, frankly, are coming out of the the, uh, the larger district, Lexington One and Karen Woodward's uh, mm -hmm. district there. Uh, there are pilot initiatives through the Transform SC that are happening around the state. Some are in, you know, the poor, more rural areas, but some are also in, you know, medium and, and large areas. Yeah, uh, uh, Ivan, let's pull you into this dis discussion here. Um, uh, in the sustainable energy business in North Carolina, is is there some hope now that you've kind of dodged the bullet that you mm -hmm. know the North Carolina GOP was going to really upend your world, and that seems like that's that's past for now. But mm -hmm. can sustainable can the sustainable energy business be a place for serious job growth enough to close this gap? Well, it already has been. Uh, we know for at least the last six years, we've been measuring uh, jobs in the industry, and uh, the industry has increased its employment in North Carolina every single year for the last six years. Uh, right through the entire recession. Uh, we have uh, increased the number of firms exporting uh, to other states and around the world uh, from maybe five countries five years ago to um, I think over 35 countries now. <clears throat> what we're seeing is uh, universities, tra there are training programs throughout the community college system, high schools, universities, uh, statewide. Mm -hmm. uh, we've made a database of all of them. Uh, it's really phenomenal. There's projects and employment in every single county in our state. And, and let me ask you this. Um, I, I made some reference and we talked off camera about the, uh, there's a renewable energy standard, and I know you know this, uh, but for mm. the benefit of those that don't, renewable energy standard in North Carolina is 12.5% of, of the power generated in North Carolina needs to come from a sustainable or renewable source. And that was at serious risk during this last session mm -hmm. of the General Assembly in Raleigh. Um, uh, crisis was averted, um, mm -hmm. but I guess good for the industry, but is, is this something that could come back up? Is this, is this maybe just postponed, or how do you feel about mm -hmm. the risk at, at which sustainable energy is in North Carolina, given that uh, the North Carolina GOP has, has changed some of the rules? Well, I think it's at ever decreasing risk, because what's happened is in the last two election cycles, we had uh, two-thirds of our legislators in our state are in their first or second term. So they needed an opportunity, and we've been providing it, connecting them with industry, economic development, academia, with R&D mm -hmm. and demonstration, to see firsthand in their districts uh, how jobs are growing, there's investment coming in, growing tax base. And, and they, they, everyone needs the opportunity to learn together and, and see firsthand exactly how this is working on the ground. It's not something that needs to have incentives forever so on and so forth. Uh, so parsing ideology from the benefits that are the reality. Uh, as more legislators see that, I think the threats diminish of rollbacks and we start transitioning to a dialogue about, okay, what is the path to long-term affordable energy and what is the contribution that clean energy makes? Do, do you feel like, and, and I want to put you on the spot here a little bit, Ivan, sure. do you feel like Republicans in North Carolina are getting a uh, unfair rap that they're being so hard on changing some some of the uh, making some draconian changes as some people have said mm -hmm. well I, maybe uh, maybe I'm too blunt sometimes but let's call a spade a spade I think that um, there is um, political pressures um, during campaign seasons uh, that uh, where people say and do things for reasons other than focused on let's mm -hmm. deliver affordable reliable safe energy and uh, then when elected officials get into office and they need to make decisions, they learn about what, what delivers affordable, reliable mm -hmm. energy. And they start to depart uh, maybe from the ideology of politics mm -hmm. and start to make policy. Uh, so, I, so I think that's exactly what we're experiencing right now. And then they have to go back and reconcile their policy decisions with the politics of their life. Um, and that's tough. I, I don't envy them. Uh, 
you know, the, <laughs> I yeah, don't know what else I can say. No, no, I, I, I think you kind of answered the question, but we're, we're going to run out of time here in the, in the next minute before we bring our guest on trip. Uh, you know, one of the issues in South Carolina, you talked about Transform SC, that are businesses that have come together to transform education in South Carolina. One of the leadership in there, Pamela Lackey, came out swinging recently and said, listen, uh, the education system in South Carolina, it's, it's, it, it doesn't need some tweaking. It's obsolete. It's broken. And she's not the only one. Mike Brennan has said right. this over and over. Is this the kind of dialogue that gets legislators' attention? Will that help? Uh, yeah, I think I think it does. I think more importantly are the the, um, the data that these groups are going, going to be developing, uh, the pilot programs that are within the Transform SC um, network that they're working on now. I think when you have though people like Mike and Pam and others in the ch state chamber and all the groups, and again, it's not just one or two folks. It is a large coalition that is agreeing that. You know, what we had has worked, but we can do this a whole lot better, and we have to do it a whole lot better. Yeah. You know, it was even good to see that uh, uh, Governor Governor Haley showed up at the chamber recently and, and had a uh, tete-a-tete -tete with, if you will, business leaders about education. It seems like that's going the right direction. And she, she's doing that with a lot of groups, not just the business leaders. She's been meeting with a lot of groups around and um, seems to be yeah. uh, preparing to, to make education a major focus. Um, okay, we're going to keep this going around education to some degree. Next week on this program, though, uh, his name's Jim Blaine. Jim is the CEO of this nation's second largest credit union out of Raleigh, <coughs> the State Employee Credit Union, almost a $28 billion, let's call it what it is, a bank. Jim Blaine will be here next week, and then in two weeks, a two-part series around some of the most creative and innovative entrepreneurs in the Carolinas. Uh, that is in two weeks here on Carolina Business Reviews. You know, it seems like the Clemson trustees made a very good call back in 1999 when they selected then Professor James Barker to lead the South Carolina Land Grant University. Barker was a bit of a surprise choice and has turned out to be equally a surprisingly and solidly strong leader for the school. Now, after 14 years as the top tiger, he joins us again. We welcome back Clemson University President James Barker. Welcome back and congratulations on what a great tenure you've had. Thank you, Chris. It's nice to be with you. Um, James, when you look back in the last 14 years, uh, what are you most pleased with that has happened on your watch? I think it's our self-concept. I think our self-concept has changed. We, we expect greatness. We were hoping for greatness, uh, I think, earlier, and now our standards are, are such that we won't accept anything less than that. So that translates into all different aspects of the university. So I. I look back on that and recognize that change in self-concept. I think it's a, uh, a key uh, move for Clemson and one that I hope is sustainable. I, I feel very comfortable that it is. You know, when you've got, we, we were talking off camera, and you've got five presidents at Clemson over 15 years, and, and uh, nothing disrespectful about any of those who they came before you, but they were forgettable. We're trying to remember <laughs> who they were. You're almost the Ronald Reagan of Clemson <laughs> University. You made them feel better about being a Tiger again. <laughs> Well, I, I was maybe uh, not for a USC grad. <laughs> I was a dean for 13 years before that, so I know how hard it is to c sustain any kind of real planning effort if you have that much change in such a short period of time. So I promised our board I'd stay at least 10 years. Uh, I didn't ask for a 10-year contract. The board said, "Well, that's fine. You're on a day-to-day -day contract." <laughs> but uh, my commitment was to to stay long enough to where we could actually have a plan and then try to execute that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Dr. Parker, you've had, first off, thank you for your service to the state of South Carolina. It's, it's, it's been great for all of us. Um, I'm curious, so you've had such a unique perch uh, at, uh, at Clemson University. I'm curious what you see, uh, um, the, the problems you see within K-12, through or the opportunities maybe. Um, if you had a one and you could do two or three things to the K-12 through system, the feeder for, for college and universities across South Carolina, what would you do? Well, I had a wand and I used it, and here's what we did. <laughs> um, we decided that so much is changing in K through 12 education, especially public education, that we needed to uh, uh, take a fresh look at, at all those changes and how we, as the largest producer of teachers in our School of Education, the Darla Moore School of Education at Clemson, need to take a fresh look at that. And so we decided to take the School of Education out of its current environment, make it its own school, its own entity with a dean, which it never never had before, and take, um, take a, a clean slate and create 
a school of education that could address the challenges that are currently there. Instead of trying to fine tune it, let's, let's begin with a fresh start. We've got wonderful faculty. Uh, I'm absolutely convinced that we can have any kind of impact and we need to do that because we are responsible as part of our, our mission for the prosperity of the state of South Carolina and we can't do that if our K-12 through education is not um, addressing the real needs that are there and I think this gives us an opportunity to do that. We want to hire the best uh, dean in the United States to come and lead this school and that's what we did. We, did, we stopped whining about it and said let's get busy and see if we can do something. You know as a quick follow up to that, Mick Zace was on this program recently and he sat where you sat and, and he said you know it doesn't have anything to do with money in the in the K through 12 system, it has everything to do with how how qualified our teachers are and how accountable those teachers are. Would you agree with that? I think it has a lot to do with money. But I think I think we also can't just say that's the only thing it's about. I think the idea of being accountable for a new set of expectations, uh, a new uh, a new environment is something that we all have to look at very hard. Mm -hmm. And I, as I would say to any of our components uh, at Clemson, let's not try to defend what we've done in the past. Let's get on with the idea of creating something fresh and new that's, that can be a leader, truly a leader in the United States. That's our expectation with this new school. Mm -hmm. I wanted to ask you, um, how did you arrive at the decisions? Uh, Clemson has done some very uh, cutting edge commitments uh, in the energy space and other areas and f facilitating research to to tackle some of our biggest problems. Uh, for example, you have the uh, wind uh, facility, Charleston. You have uh, this uh, neuron research uh, to kind of mimic nature on how to manage electricity on the whole grid. Uh, this, this is really phenomenal centers um, that you've that you've established in the university. How do, how do you arrive at those decisions and, and what can people do to keep working with with all the universities in South Carolina, North Carolina, to, to keep this kind of research happening in our region. Well, I appreciate you recognizing that effort that we've made. I think it's a, one of those perfect storms where you have an architect in the president's office who's been who's been educated about sustainability since my freshman year uh, at Clemson, uh, and a work a, a not a work ethic, but an environmental ethic that our students bring now. Their expectations are that their school ought to be practicing what we preach. If we're going to be teaching sustainability, we ought to be practicing it as well. The opportunity to do, um, to create really the world's best uh, wind energy center, which that's not an exaggeration, that's what's taking shape in Charleston, where you have a drivetrain test facility of, for the largest wind turbines that exist now and the ones that that are twice as big as that when they come online. We can test their efficiency and their ability to be um, productive uh, for long term in these two enormous machines. One of them is six stories tall. So that's, that's how big the scale of these wind, new wind turbines will be. Plus the grid simulator, which you mentioned, mm -hmm. when you produce alternative sources of energy, it's not pure. And if you put it on the grid directly, it can shut the grid down. You need a way of simulating the impact it's going to have on our electrical grid before you do that. So we had the opportunity to actually create that, the first, really the one, only one of its kind at that scale, and combine it with those two other machines uh, in a new facility which will open in October. And we had 19 of the world's 20 largest uh, wind turbine manufacturers mm -hmm. as our advisors in this process. And there's some excited people about wind energy now as a result of Clemson having the world's best energy center there. You, President Parker, you have made uh, pretty big investments. You talk about the wind uh, turbine. You talk uh, Restoration Institute in, in North Charleston. You talk about ICAR, the International Center for Automotive Research. And here we have, we have aviation, we have automotive. Big investments by Clemson University. Um, uh, we just, and I, and I know this is nothing but an example, but we watched uh, Detroit go through, a, watching them go through a very painful reorganization. Are you concerned that when the worm turns, when automotive and when aviation, they're cyclical industries and they're going to go through these up and ups and downs. So how, how do you protect against that to make sure that you're not out there on the edge? Well, I think you, I think you have to um, recognize where South Carolina's strengths and weaknesses are. Uh, but our manufacturing economy is, tra is transforming itself now into advanced manufacturing. And I had the opportunity to go to, to, to Munich this past summer uh, and talk to the board of BMW about our work and working with our, our plant there in, in uh, Greenville 
at Spartanburg, um, working alongside them to, to really understand what their workforce development needs are. And they need advanced manufacturing um, workers. And they need the, the talent that's coming out of our uh, PhD program uh, at CUI Car as well. That combination is the way they really look at their future. Mm -hmm. And it's tragedy when you look at the workforce numbers or the job opportunities and you see our employment numbers and say there are actually jobs going unfulfilled. You know, they're not, they're not filled. Mm -hmm. So how, what are we going to do in order to help prepare uh, our citizens for those kind of wonderful um, careers that they can have in advanced manufacturing? Mm -hmm. So w we need to make sure that we are serving what those needs are, but also diversifying that base because we can't be caught and having just a very narrow set of, of skills. So what we're starting to see is uh, diversifying our economy in the state. And I think our Department of Commerce is doing a great job of, of making mm -hmm. that happen. Uh, several new, um, we're gonna be the, the world's tire center now with all the new plants that are coming in. So I'm, I'm very much encouraged about the broadening the base, but what scares me is that we have job opportunities that we're not filling now. And so we've gotta be ahead at schools like Clemson and, and our research universities to prepare that workforce for what those opportunities mm -hmm. are going to be. And that all the way from the bachelor's degree through the PhD degree and working alongside in partnership with our technical schools in workforce development. Now, we have some major federal grants from the Department of Labor, uh, the National Science Foundation to create these workforce development centers in South Carolina. The technical schools are our partner. Mm -hmm. In many ways, they're leading us in that regard, and we recognize that. So that kind of transformation, I think, of our economy is gonna be needed for us to be successful and be able to sustain that long term. Mm -hmm. sure. Chris, can I, yeah. can I jump in? Well, another thing that uh, Clemson's doing, they, they host the South Carolina STEM Center, Science, Technology, Engineering, and Math. So it's also helping to develop that, that cadre of, of students through you know, um, elementary all the way through high school who, who hopefully can provide the feeder source for that. Tom Peters and the STEM Coalition, they do a great job in, in organizing mm -hmm. that stuff. So there's another role of... Is there a follow-up question for him? I'm sure there was for you, for him in there. Um, well, it sounds like you got one, but I, you know, <laughs> no, I always have. I, one. I, well, I just, I think, I think, I think it's a great thing. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm curious. You, how did that come about? How did you come to host this, this STEM mm -hmm. thing? And, and have you, have you been seen the, uh, the, um, uh, the results that you wanted out of them? Well, I think South Carolina is starting to get it about STEM education. Mm -hmm. um, we're not where we need to be, but there's been some major new ideas that have surfaced, and one of them was as simple as increasing the life scholarship that's being offered to students with certain uh, grade point averages when they get out of high school and certain ranking class. If they study in those STEM disciplines, then they can add another $2,500 to that scholarship. Hmm. So it is helping drive a growth in engineering and science at Clemson, which is one of our sweet spots hmm. anyway, to be able to increase the number. So we're seeing a, an increase in the, in the uh, students who are choosing to major in the STEM disciplines. Hmm. And uh, it, it's in, that's very, very much encouraging. The other part of all this is that we're responsible for helping our students have internships and co-ops. Now, we're seen in the United States as probably in the top 10 of schools that have internships and co-ops and the percent of our students that have had those experiences. But we looked at our own self and said, you know, we teach architecture, but we practice architecture when we design and build buildings. We teach construction science, and we also build buildings. We teach finance and we're also doing finance projects. Why don't we give internships on campus? Why, why don't we rethink this whole idea, keep the great effort at external internships, but what would an internal internship look like? And how many of those could we add? How about 500? Wow. 500. Uh, and those students are now having the benefit of being able to stay in the dorm, be able to have a semester with an internship meaningful internship directed out of our, you know, the total mm -hmm. campus working mm -hmm. together. That was really gratifying to realize that. And how many lives that's gonna affect and how, when an employer tells us, what is the most important thing that you want in a graduate? It's not where they went to school, it's not their major. You know what it is? Did they have a co-op or an internship? Mm -hmm. That rises to the top level mm -hmm. and that's how people get meaningful opportunities. Mm -hmm. And goes back to your comment about the technical college system being engaged exactly. in that dialogue. We're, we're out of time. Uh, best of luck to you going forward. I know you're going to look over your shoulders as a Clemson grad now that 
there's a school in North Carolina, Un University of North Carolina, Charlotte's playing their first football game. <laughs> so I know the Tigers are going to be looking over their shoulder. This will be interesting. Uh, best of luck to you, James. Good to have you back here. Chris, it's great to be with you. And uh, I'm just changing my major at Clemson. I'm going, <laughs> changing my major from president to be an architecture professor. Thank you again. Thank you both. Until next week. Thank you. Good night. Major funding for Carolina Business Review was provided by the Duke Endowment, a private foundation enriching communities in the Carolinas through higher education, health care, rural churches, and children's services. Blue Cross and Blue Shield of North Carolina, who's responsible for rising health care costs? Join us and many others in a candid discussion at letstalkcost.com. Grant Thornton, operating in more than 100 countries, our tax audit and advisory professionals specialize in helping companies unlock their growth potential. Novant Health, bringing you world-class technology, clinicians, and care when and where you need it. Sunoco, a global manufacturer of consumer and industrial packaging products and provider of packaging services with more than 300 operations in 35 countries. Blue Cross and Blue Shield of South Carolina, where healthcare is changing for the better. Find out how at ahealthysc.tv and by viewers like you. Thank you. Promotional consideration provided by Business North Carolina Magazine. For more information, visit carolinabusinessreview.com.